Amen. Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. It is finished. All right, see you guys later. Have a good night. Just kidding. Can you imagine, though, if we just, like, every week, we're like, it is finished. That's actually the message, though. That's the gospel. The gospel says we had an unpayable debt, an insurmountable weight of pressure, something that you couldn't get out of. You were in a closed, sealed grave. That's where your sin led you. And then along came Jesus. Along came God in human form. And he served, and he washed feet, and he hung out with fishermen and tax collectors and talked to prostitutes. He touched lepers. He healed them. He healed blind people. (laughs) But more than any of that stuff, he declared forgiveness of sins. He didn't just come to heal our earthly ailments. He came to seal our eternity in him. The whole Bible has been leading up to John 19. I love the Gospel of John. We've been walking through it now for how long? It's been like three months going through John. Feels like a year. It's been close to a year, probably. The church just started. They'll be, they'll be done in like five years, probably. But we've been going through it for a while, right? What I love about the Gospel of John compared to all the other Gospels, like the three other ones, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is that John hits on this relational side of Jesus that we don't see the full picture of in the other Gospels as much as we do in John. In fact, John was the first book that I read where I actually fell in love with Jesus and who he was. It's hard not to. You see the way he interacts with broken outcasts and even the patience that he has for the Pharisees and for his own disciples who walked with him for so long and still didn't fully know who he was or didn't fully believe in what he was saying. He walked with the people. He loved the very people that he knew were going to ditch him on this day the very people that were going to deny his name when it mattered most. A lot of us know this chapter. A lot of us know this part of the story. I mean, if you've ever been to a Good Friday service, you've heard about the crucifixion of Christ. So I want to focus less on the brutality that Jesus went through physically, which was an insurmountable amount of pain that he went through. We're going to walk a little bit through that. But I want to kind of view this chapter the same way we've been viewing the rest of John, with this upside-down view. Jesus is an upside-down Messiah. He is not the Messiah that the Jews thought they were getting. He was born in Bethlehem, born in a trough, born from a Virgin Mary before she was married. He comes from the line of of David, a horrible sinner. (laughs) If you don't believe me, read any of David's story. Broken individual. He comes from a broken line. And he was raised in Nazareth. You guys remember that phrase? What good comes out of Nazareth? Jesus. <laughs> he was raised in a city that people were like, Nazareth? That's not what our Messiah is supposed to be. Our Messiah is supposed to come riding in on a horse with a sword, and he comes in on a donkey, right, to the city. Remember his conversation with Nicodemus? And he tells Nicodemus, the way to be born again is to, or the way to live is to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, are you telling me I need to go back to my mother and be reborn? Everything Jesus said came across as this upside down. He didn't come to defeat the Romans. He came to defeat sin. He came to defeat our eternal need. He came to bear the entire weight of the law that we can't do. And he did it. And so I want to look at this chapter upside down. I want to look at this not as a sad chapter of our Savior being horribly tortured and dying, but I want to look at this with the lens of the gospel and see this as a joyous chapter. It's with this lens of the cross that we live every single day. We, we live our lives every day with the banner above our head that reads, it is finished. It is finished. And because of that, For the rest of our lives, we get to rest in the finished work of Christ. The weight of the law is done. It's been paid. Jesus came. He lived perfectly, and he died on the cross, and guess what? It worked. We forever have this communion with God now. So we're going to go through verse by verse, and we're going to hit some of this stuff. 
looking at it in that context. And another thing I want to point out too is it's easy to read a chapter like this and to see a guy like Pilate who had the authority to, uh, to you know, release Jesus, essentially, but he went through with the crucifixion. And it's easy for us to look at that and be like, oh, I'm going to strive to not be a Pilate. I'm going to strive to be a courageous go-getter and fight injustice, but that's not what this chapter is saying at all. What this chapter is yelling is, this was God's plan. No one could stop God's plan. God's plan and his will was that Jesus would die for us. God's will was to send his son so that all who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That what's going to be displayed here is all a part of God's plan. Nothing surprises him. And on top of that, Jesus fully knew what was going to happen and fully took it on with pure love for you, knowing what he was going to endure, knowing that what he was going to endure was, was beyond the physical ailment, but actually he was also going to endure the full wrath of God, which none of us in this room can comprehend the full wrath of God. It's, it's as deep as his love, right? Can't even comprehend how, how vast it is. Jesus could, because he was God. So he saw what he could understand, this wrath, and he's like, I'm going to take that on for all of us. That's what this chapter's about. It's incredible. So let's look at it. Chapter 19. Join me, verse 1 through 5. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So last week, if you guys were here last week, we walked through um, Jesus' conversation with Pilate leading into chapter 19. And the whole time that Pilate is interacting with Jesus Jesus isn't really saying a word. And the only times he does say a word is kind of declaring who he is, um, that he's the son of God. But Pilate is looking for a way out. Pilate is starting to see, this guy's innocent. <laughs> I'm about to put somebody through one of the most brutal forms of torture and death, and this guy's innocent. So that's where we find ourselves. Pilate is still struggling with this idea that he's about to kill an innocent man. He's about to put an innocent man on this, on this cross to hang and die. So that's where we find ourselves in chapter 19. So Pilate devises a plan. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll flog him first. So in, in verse 1, he says, Then Pilate took Jesus and, and flogged him. And that word flogged in, in the Gospel of Mark um, is another word for scourged, which means in those days um, it was a Roman judiciary punishment. So they would have this whip, um, and it had glass and bone and metal on the ends of the whip on multiple lashes. And what they would do is they would interrogate their prisoners as they would whip them with this to get answers out of them, for them to confess their guilt so they know they're killing a guilty person. So they're scourging Jesus. They're literally whipping him. And the idea of this whip was, is you would whip somebody and it would attach. So the metal, the glass, the bone would dig into your skin as you whipped, boom, hits you. It digs in, and then they would pull back, and it would rip it out. So that was the idea. And there wasn't a limit of time on this. It was until the person confessed, and Jesus was silent. He was silent. So he's being whipped, and he's silent. So Pilate does this, still not getting answers out of Jesus, tortures him. And then the soldiers are like, okay, we're going to mock him too. Because you have to understand the, the Romans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Romans, right? So the Romans were like, we have what this guy claims to be the king of the Jews, so we're going to mock him. So they, they made a crown of thorns and they dug it into his head, right? So Jesus is wearing these crown of thorns on his head and they clothe him in a purple robe and purple is the color of royalty. So they're like, oh, this is your king? Oh, we'll show you a king. <laughs> so they put a purple robe on him to mock him and a crown. And the soldiers, they came up to Jesus saying, Hail, King of the Jews, right, mocking him, and struck him with their hands. And Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Pilate's like, Is this enough? 
Look, look how much we've tortured him. He hasn't said a word. He's obviously not guilty. Look, I find no guilt in him. He's not guilty. He's telling the Jewish leaders and the chief priests, he's not guilty. Look, look at him. And so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, verse five, and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, behold, the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid. So even though they've seen Jesus and he's got flesh ripped out of him, literally, and he's being clothed with his robe and he's got a crown of thorns on him and it's clearly innocent, their response is still crucify him, kill him, torture him more, kill him more. And Pilate's like, no, I, there's no, he's not guilty. I'm not going to kill him. And they say, well, he's guilty under our law. And what they were referring to was Jesus proclaiming to be God. So they were referring to blasphemy, right? The Jewish way of punishment in those days to kill somebody is you would stone him. Remember when Jesus saved the woman, they were stoning her and uh, she was caught in adultery and Jesus turns to the, the Pharisees that are stoning her and he's like, hey, you that's without sin, cast the first stone. And then they all like drop their rocks and it was Jesus showing them, you all deserve death. And the salvation itself was speaking into them and saying, I'm here to forgive, not to kill. But they turn on him and they say, kill him for nothing. But they don't want to stone him. They want, they want the Romans to kill him. They want him to get the crucifixion. They want him to get the cross. But again, looking at it with our view, no, 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 this was God's plan. This was God's plan, and this is what Jesus' plan was too. So when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Okay, there's a little bit of context here. In the, in the book of Matthew, all the Gospels, they harmonize, right? They're all the same story from different perspectives. It's really cool. In the book of Matthew, Pilate's wife has a dream, okay? And Pilate's wife um, says to him, to Pilate, have nothing to do with that righteous man, talking about Jesus, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. <laughs> okay, so Pilate's wife has a dream about Jesus, and it freaked her out. I don't know what the dream was. I would love to ask her someday. I would love to ask God someday in heaven and be like, what was that dream? Like, what did you show her? But she goes to her husband and she says, have literally nothing to do with this righteous man. So she's proclaiming to Pilate, I had a dream. This guy's innocent. Have nothing to do with him because I've been tortured all day with the thoughts of this dream I had last night. So when Pilate hears the Jewish priest saying he's disobeyed our law, he's, he's blasphemed, he's declared himself God, I bet you Pilate in that moment was like, thought of the dream. And he was like, oh shoot. So just imagine for a second here, okay? Pilate is trying to stop an insurrection of the Jewish people. He's trying to stop a riot. And he's got this innocent guy that they're all crying, crucify him, crucify him. And he's having to deal with his inner morality in a sense and be like, this is an innocent guy. We, we don't have to torture and kill this guy anymore. So he's dealing with that. And then on top of that, his wife comes to him and says, I have nothing to do with this guy. This dream hit me. And so Pilate is probably thinking in his head, I think this guy is who he says he is. And I'm about to kill him. I just got done whipping him. And now I'm going to kill him? So Pilate in his fear, he goes to Jesus. Verse 9, he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? He's like trying to throw him a softball. He's like, just give me anything. If you tell me anything, I can let you go. So just say something. Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, that the lamb was silent to the slaughter. So Jesus is fulfilling prophecy by not saying anything. He's proving who he says he is. Verse 10, so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So Jesus, the first time, like he responds in this whole thing, 
isn't, yes, I'm innocent, let me go. It's telling the guy who has authority, actually, you don't have authority. You wouldn't have any authority if it wasn't given to you from God. So Jesus is saying, this is beyond you, Pilate. This is God's will. You have no authority what takes place today. What's happening today is going to happen because God had planned it since before creation. So Pilate, I just can't imagine how he would respond to that. Tell me anything. Jesus responds, you don't have authority. Jesus, or God does. Verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. <laughs> so when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. Okay, that's a... That's a intentional line there, okay? This is an intentional time. This is how you know God's plan is not just this like reckless thing that's like he's just making it happen as he goes along. No, this was, this was formulated in time and God knew exactly what was going to happen. He planned this very thing. Preparation of the Passover. What is the Passover? The Passover, remember, was, to, was a holiday that celebrated the deliverance out of Egypt that the Israelites had, right? And the firstborn, um, it was the last plague to Pharaoh, that Moses said the firstborn will die unless you have blood on your door, right? The blood, and so the angel of death will pass over any door that has blood on it, and he won't kill the firstborn. Well, Jesus himself is our Passover. His blood covers us so that when God looks at us, he doesn't look at us with punishment or wrath anymore. He looks at us as the finished work of Christ. He looks at us and he sees his son because our identity now is Christ, so this preparation of the Passover is really intentional. Jesus is actually being prepped for crucifixion on the week of Passover. The time is nearing. It's being prepared as the time when Jesus would actually be the sacrificial lamb that would spray his blood on all of us. And I know it sounds graphic, but it was graphic. So this preparation is happening. It's going down. And they say, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. I love it. I mean, the Jewish people this whole time, they're, they're thinking that their Messiah is going to come in, he's going to kill all the Romans, and he's going to, uh, you know, bring up these Israel people, or these Jews, and they're all going to rule the land or whatever, and that's what their Messiah is. But now that the Messiah is not who they thought he was, now they're turning to the enemy, siding with the enemy to overthrow the Messiah. It's like this whole upside down thing. But in our eyes, when we look at this with the upside down view, we know that if Jesus didn't die this day, if God's plan didn't happen, we wouldn't have victory. So this whole passage is our victory, even though they're mocking it, and even though that they're trying to thwart it, they can't. Okay. So it's about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Pilate speaking, verse 14, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to them to be crucified. So the very thing they're claiming Jesus deserves to die for, which is claiming to be God, they're actually committing another act against the law by putting a God before God. They're putting Caesar before their own God in order to kill God. It's like, what were they thinking in this period of time? Like he's literally fulfilling it and they're totally missing it. There's another passage in, in Matthew around this time where Pilate, you know, washes his hands. He's like, this blood of this innocent man is on your hands, Jews. Like, this is yours. You're killing him. I'm not killing him. And they respond, his blood be on us and our sons. That's like, we'll take full responsibility for this death. But again, I look at that phrase, his blood be on us and our sons, and I say, Amen because that's what happened. I believe in Jesus. I'm covered in the blood of Christ. So what they meant for evil, God turns it for good. His blood be on us and our sons, and that's exactly what Jesus was there to do. He was there to save all those who believe by his death. So they say, we have no king but Caesar, so he delivered him out over 
to them to be crucified. Verse 17, so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called, uh, to the place of the school, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Okay, so just to know the pain here, he has multiple gash wounds on his back and probably on his ribs as the whip went around and tore, right? And so now he's told, you got to carry your own cross, which is what they would do. They would carry their own cross to the place of crucifixion. So he's carrying this cross, and I'm sure the splinters, I mean, it's not this clean, nice little cross you see on pictures in your mom's basement or whatever of Jesus and, yeah, all that stuff with gorgeous hair. That's not what the scene was. <laughs> he's carrying a cross, and he's got gashes on his back, and I'm sure the cross is digging into the gashes, right? You guys ever had a splinter? So multiple splinters digging into his back as he's carrying this heavy cross, right? Enduring this unimaginable pain. And he's wearing this crown of thorns. So there's thorns digging into his head. There's blood getting in his eyes. He's being spit on. He's getting beaten. He's getting whipped. All of this pain. And then in verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And I love that line because that is God. And God is saying, what I have planned is happening. So Jesus is now placed near the city where everybody can see him. Okay? And he's hanging on this cross. He's got nails in his hands and his feet. And he's hanging there. And over him says, Jesus from Nazareth, King of the Jews. Crazy. And I can't help but think of another reference this is making. Do you remember the story of um, Moses and the people? They disobeyed God. And so, they, uh, so God sent them like venomous snakes. <laughs> it's just Old Testament's crazy. But they disobey God, and there's venomous snakes, and they start biting the people, and the people start dying, getting sick. And God tells Moses, hey, make this uh, bronze snake around this pole and, and ha- hold it up in the air and like, place it somewhere. And when the people look at that, they'll look at it and be healed. Okay, So he does, and the people get healed by just looking at this bronze snake on a, on a pole. It's the same symbol that they have on ambulances still today. If you look at that, it's from Old Testament. It's kind of cool. But Jesus, here he is hanging on a cross, and over him says, here's Jesus from Nazareth, king of the Jews, and it's written in all the languages they would understand. And we look at him, we believe in him, and we're healed. He's fulfilling prophecy. By their mockery, by their killing him, it's actually fulfilling God's perfect plan. Our savior, our salvation, our healing, hanging on a cross for all to see. It's this awesome moment of reference showing this is who he says he is. And Pilate's response to them, what I have written, I have written. So when the soldiers, 23, had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So by their mocking the Savior, they're actually showing validity to what he's doing because they're fulfilling scripture. So by mocking scripture, they're fulfilling scripture. It's this whole upside down thing. All this stuff was prophesied. They were going to cast lots. They were going to do all this stuff. And they're literally fulfilling it while they're making fun of them like, Oh, you're the king. If you're the king, they say stuff like, you know, if you're the king, why don't you get down there and and save yourself then? You know, if you're really God. But it's like, do you really? Like the same people that are yelling that kind of stuff are the same people that knew that he rose Lazarus from the dead, that he fed 5,000 with a couple fish and some loaves of bread. But now here he is on the cross and they're saying, if you're really God, come down. But if he was really God, he would stay up there because that's what the Old Testament says. That's what prophecy says and he's doing it. He's proving he's God. He's proving he is the Messiah. So they're not getting their way. 
<laughs> so it's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's awesome. So the soldiers did these things, verse 25, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw this, or when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, and we think that's John, the guy writing this. The guy writing this is, is standing right in front of Jesus here. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Again, another fulfillment. Jesus said, you know, you're all gonna, when I go on the cross, you're all gonna scatter. You're all gonna go to your own homes and I'm gonna be left there alone. He's like, but don't worry, I'm not alone. God's with me. And then he says, and don't fear because I've overcome the world. So by him saying this, it's a comfort to his family. Hey, remember what I told you? It's okay. I've overcome the world. Don't fear. Go home. In the midst of this agony, in the midst of this unimaginable pain, Jesus has the wherewithal to look at his mother and to love her, <laughs> to look at his disciple and to love him, to care for them. He's, he's literally hanging on a cross and he's caring for these people. <laughs> it's crazy. This is the kind of love that, that he has for us, that he endured all that and he would do it again for you. Good thing he doesn't have to do it again, but he did it for you. After this, verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And that's Psalm 69, 21. So he's fulfilling more scripture as he's going along. He's just proving more and more that he's the Messiah. And he says, I thirst. And so a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So this wine was meant to dehydrate people to... to speed up the process of killing them, right? So I'm thirsty. Oh, here's like essentially vinegar, <laughs> right? It dehydrates you. So that's what they're giving him. They're putting on a sponge and like putting it up to his face. And then when he received it and he's fulfilled all the scripture, he says, it is finished. And he dies. That's the greatest phrase I think Jesus has ever said. It is finished. Because it wasn't just talking about at that moment, your sins up to that point were forgiven. Or when you get saved, your sins up to that point are forgiven. But now, really make sure. No, no, no. The phrase, it is finished, means your past, present, and future sins have been forgiven. When Jesus said, it is finished, our sins, our guilt, our shame, the weight of God's wrath finished in that moment over us. And it was placed on Jesus. These three words, they encapsulate so much, but there's more to this chapter, so we'll, we'll come back to that. So we gotta finish this. But I'll just paraphrase some of this stuff. So what happens next is Jesus dies, it's this really sad scene for people there, but also a joyous scene for some people there. And uh, the Jews are like, hey, can we speed up the process a little bit? Can you break their legs? So, Because <laughs> the idea was, you know, you're, you're nailed to a cross like this, and the way to breathe is you press up on the nail that's it's in, your, in your legs or your feet or whatever. So you press up on that nail, right, the nerve endings. You're pressing up to breathe <gasps> like that. And so what they would do to speed up the process is break the legs so they can't breathe. Okay, so they break the two thieves on the cross, their legs, which is kind of brutal. So they break their legs, and they go to break Jesus' legs, but he's already dead. Again, another fulfillment of Scripture, not a bone will be broken. Right? He's the spotless lamb. His bones aren't breaking. So they say he's already dead. So to test that theory, they throw a spear into his side. Blood and water come out, another fulfillment of Scripture. Right? That same blood and water that we're covered in. We're set free, we're cleansed. All that stuff happens. And then after that, after he's pierced and it's, they're like, okay, he's for sure dead. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, 
asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. 39, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come by Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, but about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices as it is burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So we get some returning characters. Nicodemus comes back, right? Which is such a cool, that's such a cool testament to Jesus' impact on him, right? So he comes back and he helps bury Jesus. And it sets the scene for next week, for the resurrection. But I want to spend some time on those three words, it is finished. Because I think we can look at a passage like this and be like, this is a joyous passage because three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And while that's true, this is a joyous passage just because of what he did on this day too. The phrase, it is finished, means your guilt, your shame that you put yourself through today, your obligation mind that says, I got to read my Bible because I got to get, I got to do better, I got to love harder because it slaps that view in the face and says, it is finished. What it means to live your life under the banner of it is finished means you get to rest in the finished work of Jesus. I use this analogy, I think last time I spoke, but it's like you're in debt, $25 million. Can't pay it, all your resources are gone. And then Jesus comes in and he pays off your debt and you're like, whoa, that's incredible. My whole debt is paid, crazy. And then Jesus says, yeah, but I'm also going to give you an infinite amount of money into your account too, so that you never run the risk of running into debt again. So not only did he pay your debt off, but he also gave you eternal life because of his work. His work didn't just finish for you at salvation, and then he was like, all right, I'm done. Now it's up to you to do the rest 20% to get to heaven. He did 100% for you and then some. His love for you is overflowing. Ephesians 1 says he lavished his grace upon you with full wisdom and insight. Fully knowing who you were, Jesus chose, I'm going to brutally die and take on God's wrath for you, even though I know you're still going to spit in my face every day. Even though I know you're going to sin against me, I'm still going to cover you. And all you have to do is just believe in me, trust in me, receive me. We receive this gift that God has given us, And now we live the rest of our lives resting in the phrase, it is finished. The game is over. We now live in victory of what Christ has done. Another analogy, because I love analogies. You're playing basketball, okay? Before the game starts, it's you and your team, and you're huddled in the, what is it, locker room? Gosh, it's been like 11 years since I've been in high school. It's crazy. You're in a locker room, and I was homeschooled, so we didn't have a locker room. It was just my bathroom, so. But you're in a locker room, and it's your whole sports team, and you're getting pumped, right? You're like, we're going to beat this team, maybe. But the other team are 12-footers, 12-foot tall. That's the other size. 12-foot tall basketball. And before the game starts, actually, uh, they're up 50 to nothing, because that's just, they have a handicap in that way. They, they get a free 50 nothing. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. So you have an insurmountable game <laughs> in the locker room. These guys are 12 feet tall, and you're, you're crying with your team, because the result is if you lose this game, you're going to spend eternity in hell. <laughs> now you're awake. <laughs> Good. No. Yeah, that's your, if you lose, you're going to hell. Good luck. So you're crying. You're trying to prepare yourself mentally for hell. You're like uh, standing close to the heater to get used to the heat or something, right? You're like closing your eyes like, I got to get used to darkness, right? Trying to be Batman, trying to, yeah, be raised in the dark. That's a Batman reference. So you're in the locker room, you're screwed. <laughs> the, game, <laughs> like, the game hasn't even started yet, but it's over. And uh, you're bawling your eyes out, and before you know it, two hours have passed, right? And uh, Jesus walks in, and he's like, what do you guys... What are you guys crying about? 
what are you talking about, Jesus? We're about to play this game. He's like, about to play this game. He's like, I finished it 10 minutes ago. And you're like, what? And you walk outside, and somehow their 50 to nothing lead went to zero. You're like, how did that happen? And you've won a million to nothing. Okay? You won. And Jesus gets you. He pulls you, and he's like, look at the scoreboard. Do you trust that? Do you trust that I did that for you? Yeah. The victory is yours. (laughs) But I feel like a lot of times we look at that and we go, the victory's ours, but I still want to show people how good I am at dribbling basketball. And Jesus is like, dude, it is finished. I want to show how well I can read my Bible. It is finished. You get to read your Bible now. You get to see these things. You get to look at everything now with this lens of it is finished. You get to see each other as on the same playing field. You are no better than the person next to you. You are just as deserving as that hell as he was, as she was. Jesus' death for you was for the world, and all those who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Because Jesus was beaten for you, you don't have to beat yourself up over your past, present, or future. Because Jesus was bound, you are no longer enslaved. Because Jesus bore the cross on his back, you no longer have a burden to carry. Because Jesus bled, you are healed. Because Jesus took 100% of your guilt and made it his own, no one can shame you, not even yourself. Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You are forgiven for sins you don't even know about. Because Jesus gave up heaven for 30 years of his life, you get it for eternity. Because Jesus took on the wrath of God, God never looks on us with wrath, but with satisfaction in his son. Because Christ was condemned, as Paul says in Romans 7, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The weight of death has been lifted. The gospel isn't, I will courageously die for Jesus. The gospel, the good news is, Jesus courageously died for me. So my life doesn't look like Jesus, it looks like it needs Jesus and it realizes that it has him fully. Full wisdom and insight he gave us. He sealed us with the promised Holy Spirit. You are his forever if you believe in him. You trust in him. That is good news. So may we look at 19, this chapter, this crucifixion with joy, this upside down. It is finished. Amen. I'm covered in the blood of Christ forever. And I'm loved by the king. And he is worthy of all praise. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you did it all. We thank you that you have paid it all, Lord. We thank you that we get to be healed in your name. We thank you that you've covered our sins and then some. We thank you that we get to now rest in you in this peace that surpasses understanding. We thank you, Lord, that there's multiple books in the Bible that dig more into what chapter 19 means for us. And we thank you that it's there to walk us through the depth of your love for us. We praise your name because you alone are worthy. And we praise you that you also rose from the dead, raising us to life in you. We can't wait to hear that next week. We love you, Lord. your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys at Life Groups on Wednesday.